Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Tony Lee from a company called Medipost. We are a Korean company. I'm trying to advance my slides. Sorry. So we found in 2000, based in Seoul, Korea, uh, we listed company in COSDAQ with market cap of around US uh, $470 million or so. We have 220 employees based in Korea. Half of us uh, is in R&D and regulatory affairs, and we have a GMP manufacturing as well. We operate Cold Blood Bank, that's our um, core business uh, when the company started. And then also since 2001, we've been doing uh, allergenic cell therapy product development uh, using umbilical cord blood derived MSCs from um, a donor material. And we operate our own GMP manufacturing facility, uh, 1,500 square meters, that's about 16,000 square feet flow space uh, that's manufacturing our commercial product, as I'll show you, and also our clinical trial material that's going in Korea. We have a direct U.S. subsidiary wholly owned, uh, Medipost America, which is uh, based in Rockville, Maryland, just up north here. Uh, we have commercial rights for two lead assets, which I'll show you some data for, uh, for uh, Americas and the European Union and Australia. So we operate largest cold blood bank in Korea. We, we hold, this is obviously private material, 10% of our of of public as well, but some 230,000 or so units of cold blood. Uh, that's our business, uh, and then so-called cash cow business. And then we've been uh, working on uh, allergenic cell therapy off the shelf, uh, a product development, and a product called Cardistem was approved to BLA from Korea in 2012, and accumulated number of patients treated on market so far to this month is uh, some 5,200 patients or so. And we've also have the, uh, this is a cosmetic line using uh, culture media, condition media, or cell culture, MSCs. So to this audience, there's two slides. Just this is a regulatory framework in Korea that is actually uh, implemented um, for over a decade now um, that controls autologous allergenic. If it happens, so-called minimal manipulation at the medical center, then this is medical practice. And as most of you will know, this autologous allergenic will all fall under uh, this regulatory framing under cell therapy products if it's uh, more than minimally manipulated, that is ex vivo expansion and so forth. So we, we fall under this category. We've been doing preclinical and clinical work based on that frame. Uh, so as other companies, so these are four products so far that's actually been approved by Korean regulatory agency in Korea. 2011, 12, and then 14. These two are often. Three of them are autologous-based products, and ours is allergenic product. This is for degenerative osteoarthritis for college repair, as I'll show you some data from our phase three. You can see the other products as well. <clears throat> so this is a product pipeline for our company. Uh, this uh, lead product called Cardistem, this is actually on the market after phase one and three trials in Korea. Phase one, two, uh, clinical trial with the US FDA IND is completed. I'll show you some data on that. Second product I would like to talk to you about is Pneumostem. Uh, this is for a orphan indication called bronchopulmonary dysplasia. This is pediatric orphan indication. I'll show you some data later on. Finished phase one first in human, phase two undergoing in Korea right now. Phase one, two complete in the US. And the third program, which I'm not going to talk to you today, is Neurostem for Alzheimer's disease, which is uh, phase two in Korea right now, after successful phase one, uh, first in human in Korea, uh, pre-IND stage with uh, US FDA at the moment. So the degenerative OA, this is the bit of a background. So when you have a cartilage defect or, or, or injury or damage, it, the ICRS, which is International College Repair Society, classifies into basically four grades. And grade four is the worst condition where you actually have bare bone, basically. So this is uh, a less uh, thickness uh, left on the cartilage and until you actually lose complete cartilage and then you expose the bone. And, and over a period of time, uh, in, in a typical degenerative osteoarthritis patients have multiple uh, defects uh, or cartilage damages in your knee and that goes over time. And this is uh, really uh, the uh, target patient pool or profile that where we developed this product called Cardistem. So this is a human umbilical cord blood derived off the shelf allogenic mesenchymal stem cell product that is the API, and we manufacture and release with a high viscosity, high molecular weight hyaluronic acid that gets mixed into a gel at the operating room, and then you, it, it, it requires a simple surgery, either through open arthrotomy or using arthroscopy. So this is the ICRS grade four lesion. As I told you, all our phase three patients had to have four grade four lesions, varying sizes. So there's one patient here. We, we drill holes here and then put this gel mixture containing uh, seven and a half million cells, 
per three square centimeter defect. So if you have a bigger size defect, then you have two or three doses. And this is a three months view. And then after 20 months, you actually, we managed to recreate the cartilage. So based on that initial cl uh, clinical proof of concept, we've uh, gone into phase one, two for safety. And then phase three, this was now done seven, eight years ago in Korea uh, with five year follow-up data now available. Um, this was a randomized uh, multicenter trial with a cardiac stem versus active control, which is microfracture. It's a standard care treatment where you drill holes through the exposed bone to cause bone marrow bleeding, and then your own bone marrow stem cells would actually uh, uh, lead to some regeneration of cartilage, but it is known to be limited by patients' age up to about 55 years of age. Beyond that, that this procedure doesn't really work. Uh, doesn't really work. So the primary endpoint was treating 104 patients randomized into two groups and then single treatment with either cardiac stem or microfracture, and then waited for one year and then looked inside the knee with arthroscopic second look to see if the regeneration of cartilage is taking place because everybody had to be at grade four, which is bare bone, with varying sizes. Secondary endpoints were to measure the pain and function scores, and obviously safety. So these are actually the number of patients suffering from degenerative joint disease by age, including knee osteoarthritis in Korea. But this pattern is not dissimilar in the US or Europe, where the current intervention of care, uh, there are two treatments really. Microfracture, as I said, below the age of 50, 55, can be treated um, on that college defect or you have to really wait long enough to receive knee replacement or total or partial knee replacements or artificial knee joints. And that is because they have limited lifespan of anywhere between 10, 15 years. So if you get it done when you're 60, by the time you're 70, you have no option. So, so the orthopedic surgeons would ask you to deliberately wait for that period of time, and there's only really a painkiller and some NSAIDs. So to really mimic that landscape, we've deliberately enrolled these patients. These are 104 patients enrolled in a phase three study and distribution by age. And you can see uh, we deliberately enrolled the target patients here with, uh, who actually present the case of symptoms of uh, typical degenerative osteoarthritis with big lesions and multiple lesions. So this is one, uh, basically our primary endpoint data of that phase three study. At one year, we've asked, everybody was at grade four, which is bare bone with different sizes, with single treatment after cardiostem or microfracture, uh, very basically asked after one year, do we have an improvement? Improvement is defined by a, a grade or better improvement in cartilage, ICRS cartilage uh, grade. So that means everybody was at four, and then you got either grade three, two, one, it means regeneration of cartilage has taken place. 90% of the patients received cartilage stem improved or regenerated cartilage versus 72%. So these are uh, some arthroscopic images before and after one year. Uh, these, this patient received microfracture. She regenerated cartilage, we belong to the 70% or so group here, although not really a full thickness. Whereas here, cartilage stem case will belong here. Uh, 97, 98% of patients actually showed regen regrowth of cartilage after one year, single treatment. Uh, we followed these patients further on, three and five years. So again, single treatment, we've just been following. Nothing has been done since the treatment. Here's a IKDC score, which is a measure of knee function. Uh, the higher the score, the better. So you have the cardiac stem treated group. They both improve, but the microfracture group actually stays here and they continue to improve in cardiac stem. These are statistically significant in three and five years. A uh, similar uh, scale called WOMAC, this is international measurements on function and pain of the knee. Uh, lower the score, the better. You can see the cardiac stem maintains at three up to five years, whereas the microfracture goes back to the baseline. This is all very uh, well in consistent with the uh, literature on microfracture uh, uh, limitations. So, so with that, um, now we're on the market for about five years now. This has been co-developed with Samsung Medical Center. We have phase one, two study with seven year follow-up that's published recently. And then phase three study, which I've shown you some data for with five year follow-up, this is actually under review uh, in, a, in a journal. And this market approval with BLA 2012, this is a label we achieved in Korea uh, with that data. Uh, this is a treating repetitive end of traumatic cartilage degeneration, including OA without age limit. I think this is a key factor. Uh, as we know with the um, other ACI products, uh, autologous chondrocyte products and microfracture, which are standard care, they're all limited by the patient's age. In our case, we actually had no limit on the uh, enrollment to recruitment of patients. This goes beyond 70 and 75 years of age, and we still see the effectiveness of regr uh, regrowth of cartilage. 
Now, US Phase 1, 2, A study, complete now with 12 subjects and two-year follow-up is all complete. And we, we're seeing the exactly same results from uh, US patients as well. So 600 patient post-market surveillance, this was a, a mandated by our Korean regulatory agency. Upon our approval, that's complete for safety. And then so far, 5,000 or so patients as of end of April has been uh, treated uh, commercially and 360 hospitals and clinics now offer this uh, listed item, um, Cardistem, in their clinics. And, and these number of doses, these are basically a number of products we've sold because some patients would have required more than one dose because of their sizes. And this is our sales by quarter uh, since our launch by patients per quarter. That's actually going up. But the actual product number would be about 15% more than this because patients will receive more than one in some cases. But you can see the sales pattern growth in the last five years. So now I'd like to change gears. This is the second product I'd like to talk to you about this morning is BPD or bronchopulmonary dysplasia. This is a pediatric orphan indication. And it's uh, actually a developmental disorder. So when an extremely preterm babies are born, their lung is not fully developed yet, and they're prone to have a fibrotic conditions with very high mortality of about 30%. Now, these high-risk group of babies are defined as uh, very low birth weight babies, and, and there's about 40,000 babies in the US and 50,000 in Europe. And, and the only supportive care is available because there's no treatment uh, or other prophylactic options. So we deliver these cells directly into the airways because these babies are already intubated and as a prophylactic measure or to prevent them from developing BPD or fall into this 30% or so mortality. And obviously if they survive, the two thirds of them would have uh, a very high likelihood of uh, cognitive disability or growth retardation, some sort of uh, neurodevelopmental disorders as well. Again, we developed this with Samsung Medical Center. Uh, because these, the, this indication is really, you're targeting the most vulnerable uh, patient or subject, so we had to do a very extensive preclinical studies to convince the Korean FDA to give us the phase one first in human approval, which was done in 2012, uh, published in Journal of Pediatrics 2014. Nine subjects, no safety issue. That led us to the phase two in Korea, there's 70 subjects double-blinded uh, placebo control study. This is still ongoing. And at the same time, we've, we've cleared IND with US FDA with phase one, two for 12 subjects uh, for the dose escalation safety trial. I'll give you some data on that one. The orphan drug designated by uh, FDA and EMA, and we've got some patterns specific for this uh, method pattern. So um, this is the phase one to a dose escalation study. This is a US study. I'm not going to show you data for Korean study. Um, and this is low dose and high dose. And we enroll these babies at three to 14 days of life. Uh, these babies would be three to 23 to 26, 27 weeks gestational age, extremely preterm with very low birth weight of less than a kilogram. And, and they would be um, exposed to our uh, treatment, administration of a drug, uh, which are, uh, again, after-shelf allogenic stem cells. And this particular study was looking for DLT and also any a death, or obviously the primary endpoint being safety. Now, we've confirmed safety on all 12 subjects, no problems, just like as we've expected and as, as we've seen in Korean subjects as well. But more interestingly, uh, when we are doing the single-site study in Chicago, we were screening patients or subjects as they were uh, being delivered or, or, or being given birth uh, prematurely. And, and here, the 25 eligible subjects were screened. This is over about 12 month period. And then we've recruited and treated 12 patients or subjects out of this 12, five, 25 eligible subjects identified, but 13 were not participating in, in the study because the constant refused by parents and some ba uh, babies were born during our vacation or study uh, vacation period and 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 so the 13 patients who only receive standard care so what we've uh, done post hoc with this particular study um, in the US was basically analyze these 12 subjects who are received enrolled and received our treatment or a stem cell uh, versus those 13 they were not included in the study but were present at the same institution around the same time with the same parameters and then to compare uh, what the subjects, the comparison quarter subjects who received standard care had any difference to our uh, subjects who actually received the treatment. And this was um, done with a uh, post hoc uh, comparison and, and uh, regression and positive pressure ventilation days. That is basically number of days these infants uh, have to be on a mechanical ventilation. 
And, and that uh, would actually show us uh, some indication as to how the babies would uh, do or their prognosis in terms of uh, their development and number of hospital days and so forth, cost of care. And here you can see this Cox regression curve for our study subjects. They're coming off the positive pressure or mechanical ventilation much sooner, these are number of days, post-birth. So they're much sooner than our eligible non-participant uh, historical control or same site eligible control group of 13 subjects. So this was actually statistically significant. So, so these type, type of data gives us very strong uh, motivation to look into uh, the next phase study, which we would like to discuss with the FDA, uh, and, and really uh, looking at any economical benefits and obviously clinical benefits from such data uh, uh, by treating these patients. So this is my last slide. So we're looking for our entity has actually got commercial rights for all these regions, Western Europe and, and Americas in Australia, and we're looking for partnerships and also some uh, spin-out uh, investment opportunities for these project financing opportunities as well. Thank you for your attention.